Thanks, Floyd. I remember when Floyd first came into my office at Berkeley. He was a physical organic chemist from Cornell who worked with Dave Collin doing lithium chemistry. And I said, Floyd, you know, we have this interesting project with antibodies and somatic mutation, and, you know, you have to pull out the gene. Floyd looked at me and he said, what's a gene? <laughs> Well, okay, <laughs> but uh, what's impressive about Floyd is he goes from zero to 200 miles an hour very quickly, so he very quickly eclipsed uh, my knowledge of, of biology in the lab and has, has done so ever since in his career. Um, what's really amazing is I think Floyd worked for me maybe 20 years ago, and today we look exactly like we did 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so it's a real pleasure to be here, and I think we have a new job for Dale Boger in the uh, president's office, okay, um, uh, in advertising. Um, anyway, uh, so it's a pleasure to be here, and I also want to thank the, uh, all the folks who support um, and have supported this lecture series over the, over the years. Um, since, since I'm really E.J. Corey's replacement, uh, I'm going to talk about synthesis, which is what I think E.J. would have talked about. Um, but our focus, we, we make molecules. Our focus isn't on structure. Um, it's actually on function. Uh, how do you make molecules uh, that don't necessarily have chemical complexity, but how do you make molecules that do very interesting functions? And that's really hard for chemists to do still today to a priori design a molecule with a specific set of biological, chemical, or physical properties. And so I would argue that really is a frontier in chemistry and who do we learn from. And the theme of our research has been to, to learn from Mother Nature. If you're interested in molecular function, recognition, the immune system, catalysis, enzymes, energy transduction to the photosynthetic center, uh, the most interesting molecules we know of come from Mother Nature. And so the, the theme of our work is uh, can we use the synthetic strategies, machinery, and molecules of Mother Nature, combine those with more traditional chemical tools to make molecules with new properties that wouldn't be easy to get by either route alone. Um, and, and really the focus of this effort will be to make molecules that really alter and control the property of living organisms, both We'll start out with large complex systems of molecules, over a million Daltons, and then we'll also focus on just small molecules under a few hundred molecular weight. And, and how do you find molecules that, that really change uh, life? So we'll start out with big interacting systems of molecules, and if you're going to change the property of a big interacting system of molecules, what system, why not uh, a bacterium itself, a living cell? And if you're going to change the properties of a living organism, what property is conserved across all of evolution? It's the genetic code. With the exception of just a handful of proteins, all life as we know it uses the same 20 amino acid building blocks uh, for as long as we, we, we can go back. Why these 20? The keto group is the most important group in synthesis. You've got to get a cofactor to get it in biology, PLP. Um, and why 20? Why not 21? Why not 25? And if we discover a life form with a 25 amino acid genetic code, will it have an evolutionary advantage? So we're really asking the question, if God had worked on Sunday, what would we look like today, okay? And we're not experiment, we're not theorists, we're experimentalists, so let's just go ahead and make a 21 amino acid organism where we add the 21st amino acid at will. And if we're gonna do this, you might as well use uh, the machine that Mother Nature invested hundreds of millions of years in evolving, the, 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 the protein translational machinery. And I would argue this is a chemical problem because we know the structure of all the molecules involved in protein biosynthesis at the two to three angstrom level. So um, what do you have to do to expand the genetic code and add amino acids at will? Well, what you need are blank codons that code for your 21st amino acid and no other. There are three stop codons in the 64 codon genetic code. You only stop translation once, so there are two degenerate stop codons. We're going to use one of both of those. Um, uh, we'll start with the TAG amber codon. You can go to a four-base code 
or you can actually begin to make E. coli genomes where you take back codons. Um, you then have to build a tRNA, the delivery vehicle that um, uh, uh, binds to your unique codon and incorporates uh, the cognate amino acid into the growing polypeptide chain. Importantly, this tRNA cannot be a substrate for the existing amino acyl tRNA synthetases in the cell. Those are the loading enzymes. So you need selectivity at that level. You then have to evolve a synthetase that uniquely recognizes your tRNA and none of the over other 80 tRNAs in E. coli. Um, and then you have to convince that synthetase to recognize your new amino acid and no other in the host cell. And again, that's a real challenge in selectivity. So we, we solve those problems using a combination of structure-based design and molecular evolution tools. And I'm not going to go into those because they've been published. But, you know, in our lab and others now around the world, over 150 unnatural amino acids have been added to the code. And, and this has been done in industry on greater than a 10,000 liter scale at five grams per liter. So it works. So the question is, what would you add to the code? Well, if you're interested in, in biophysics um, and protein structure, maybe isotopically labeled NMR probes, uh, fluorescent amino acids. Um, with Floyd, we've done um, uh, IR active amino acids. If you're interested in cell biology, photo crosslinkers, the protein protein interactions, post translational modifications, or if you're a chemist, Protein chemists may be amino acids with orthogonal chemical reactivity, and why do you need those? Well, there's a lot of interest nowadays in modifying proteins with other molecules. Um, biophysical probes, PEGs to extend half-life, and most recently, drugs, okay, um, especially antibodies uh, to make what are called antibody drug conjugates, and, and this has really actually become important in, in uh, oncology and the development of new cancer drugs. And the idea here is really the old idea of Ehrlich's magic bullet. If we take a highly cytotoxic cancer drug that kills proliferating cells but also kills normal cells, the idea is this, if you link it to an antibody that binds selectively to tumor cells that you can deliver that cytotoxic toxic agent preferentially to the tumor and achieve greater efficacy and greater therapeutic index. And, and this is really exemplified by the Genentech drug, TDM1. But what's the problem here? The problem here is if you're trying to do, modify a huge antibody molecule with a small synthetic drug, you can't do it very selectively. Most of the chemistry is nonspecific electrophilic chemistry on lysines or more targeted chemistry on cysteines, but the cysteines are involved in folding, so it's really a challenge. And, and the current antibody drug conjugates that, that have been approved are mixtures of hundreds of different molecules, okay? It, if a chemist at, at Pfizer made Lipitor and it was a mixture of two or three molecules, they would be arrested, okay? But biologists get away with this stuff for some reason, okay? Um, what makes it hard is you can't optimize the structure of a molecule when it's a mixture, okay? So what we did was genetically encode a bioorthogonal amino acid, just this aerial ketone, which you can selectively modify with an alkoxyamine derivatized, say, or statin analog. You can selectively modify this antibody at any site, pick the right site that generates the best PK and the best efficacy and safety, and for the first time begin to do really medicinal chemistry on proteins. And, and so this has been done, you know, two, two doses in a, in a rodent xenograph model completely ablate the tumor. A very close analog of this is now in patients um, with Ambrix. Um, you can apply the same approach to other antibody drug conjugates for, for autoimmune disease and, and immunosuppression and, and liver disease. But, but you can also flip this around. And instead of using the small molecule as a toxin, you can use it as a delivery vehicle. Um, and you can use the antibody to grab onto the toxin. So let's just consider prostate cancer for a minute and how we might use that approach to, to make new prostate cancer drugs. Uh, the idea here is we'll bind uh, a protein ever expressed on prostate cancer cells, um, PSMA, with a small synthetic molecule called DUPA, which binds with very high affinity and selectivity. And we'll link that now to a protein that binds a cytotoxic agent, which happens to be a cytotoxic T cell. So um, again, to, to, to do this in, in a very um, um, uh, defined way, 
you need to selectively modify this antibody fragment with the DUPA at defined sites with divine valency to optimize the formation of this immunological synapse between the T cell and the target cancer cell, and we did that. And it turns out we get very, very potent killing in vitro on the order of 100 picomolar. But more importantly, we just actually did a study with patient-derived tumors where we take patients, okay, with metastatic prostate cancer um, that's drug-resistant and put those tumors into mice at maybe 1,000 cubic millimeter. Um, and, and you can see that actually uh, administration of this, this immuno um, uh, oncology agent actually completely ablates this tumor. So people are really quite excited about this and welcome is, is funding us to move this into the clinic right now. Um, recently, there's been another approach with T cells targeting tumors called CAR T cells, okay, chimeric antigen receptor T cells. Um, and in this case, what folks do, Carl June and others do, is they take T cells out of a patient and directly transduce those T cells with a lentivirus with a receptor that binds an antigen on a tumor cell. So they put in a, an SCFV to an antigen overexpressed on the cancer cell. So when you put these T cells back in the patients, they basically go and recognize tumor and kill tumor. And the efficacy is really amazing, but the problem is, is people are dying in the clinic, okay? And the reason they're dying is because you can't control the T cell dose when you put it in, the expansion when you put it into the patients. The T cells see tumor, they expand, they proliferate, they activate, and if they overactivate, the patient can die. So we've developed a, an alternative approach, and, and, and the other real problem is if you ablate the tumor, and say it's ALL that's CD19 positive, you can't turn the T cells off. So they keep killing CD19 positive cells, which are the cells that make your antibodies. So you don't have cancer, that's the good news. You don't make antibodies, that's the bad news. So you can't turn it off either. So what we did is we made a, a, a CAR T that's specific for a not endogenous antigen, for instance, FITC or a peptide sequence absence in the proteome. When you put this CAR T into patients, circulates, it sees nothing. And then we simply make an adapter, a switch molecule, where if this was a FITC selective CAR T, we put FITC onto an antibody that binds to a tumor antigen. Now you can do what you do with small molecule drugs. You can put this in the patient and simply dose escalate your switch molecule to achieve efficacy uh, uh, under safe conditions. And when you're done, you just take it out turn it off, and more importantly, you only have to make one T cell for all cancers. So if people have heterogeneous cancers or recurrent cancers, you use the same CAR T. So we did this, and again, we use an expanded genetic code to selectively modify uh, the tumor-specific antibody with our small synthetic molecule, okay, using, uh, in this case, um, Sharpless 2 plus 3 um, chemistry. We can make these, and again, controlling the geometry is absolutely critical to making these work because it controls the geometry of the immunological synapse. And depending on what you're targeting, CD19, you may want to put the FITC here. If you're targeting HER2 positive breast cancers, you put it down here and it really matters. And this works really well. You can not only clear HER2 three, HER two three plus tumors, you can clear HER2 one plus tumors. You can clear, you know, B cell tumors, and you can clear it as well as kind of the standard CAR Ts that are made today, um, which are kind of the, um, the the gold standard. But importantly, if you actually want to control the cytokine release, which leads to this huge acute toxicity, which kills people. What we showed is if you give a mouse a tumor and you dose with a low amount of the switch molecule and the CAR T, you get very little cytokine release, but you clear almost all of the tumor. So you can control the cytokine release with a very low dose and not get a cytokine storm. And then when most of the tumor is cleared, you just simply increase the switch dose by a factor of 10 or 50, and you completely clear the tumor um, at, at the same level that the conventional CAR T's clear tumor. Um, so you actually can make this safe, we think, and that'll make it applicable to solid tumors and even outside of oncology. You can also turn it off. So we made a syngenetic mouse model where if you target B cells with a conventional anti-CD19 CAR T, you ablate all the B cells. 
if you give a CAR T targeting Fitzy and then put the switch in, you ablate all B cells. When you take the switch out, all the B cells come back. So you can turn it off too. So we think this could have a huge impact and, and it actually you only need one T cell therapy for all cancers. So we're moving in that direction too. Um, you can also use an expanded genetic code uh, to make biological probes. So if you're interested in post-translational modifications, a, a lot of eukaryotic proteins are sulfated on tyrosine. We don't know what that does because it's hard to make selectively sulfated proteins. We simply just genetically encode sulfotyrosine. And so to, to look at this in the context of a naturally sulfated protein, herudin, which is a leach protein that binds and inhibits thrombin, we introduced uh, sulfotyrosine genetically Solve the crystal structure of the complex with thrombin, and you see that the sulfate group introduces a whole new hydrogen bond network. But importantly, it drops the actual KI to 26 femtomolar, okay? So we can actually now make and probe the function of these, some of these post-translational modifications. You can also make um, photocaged proteins. Photocaged molecules, um, which are pioneered by Roger Chen and others, are really useful in cell biology because you can control the temporal and spatial concentration of molecules in a living cell. To cage proteins, you simply want to block an important um, functional group in the protein with a photochemically removable protecting group like a nitroveratroloxy group, which you can take off with 400 nanometer light. So to show the utility of this, we've caged all of these residues. We went into a yeast um, uh, a protein, a transcription factor called FO4, which responds to phosphate levels. So when there's high phosphate, um, the serine and other serines get phosphorylated, and the protein becomes a substrate for, uh, for an exporter, um, MSN5. So if we cage this, put a GFP tag on it, we see it in the nucleus. If we pulse it with light, we should actually be able to photo-initiate uh, phosphorylation. And uh, this is, let me see if I can get down here. Uh, I can't for some reason. Anyway, what you'd see is when you pulse this with light, the, 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 the protein traffics out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. So you can cage all of these kinds of processes in living cells. And you can also use, an expanded genetic code is a chemical probe too, which may seem counterintuitive, but um, what we're gonna do is probe transition states. Um, and you know, the kind of milestone in chemistry, physical organic physical chemistry was when it was well observed for the first time a transition state spectroscopically with ultra fast laser spectroscopy, but it's been really hard to actually determine the three dimensional structure of a transition state because they're very short lived uh, a time scale of vibration, bond vibrations, and it's hard to get light pulses intense um, and fast enough to, to solve the structure, three-dimensional structure of the transition state. So we said, well, the other way you can do this is simply put the transition state in a free energy well that makes it persistent enough that we could solve the crystal structure. So, so to test this notion, the transition state we looked at was rotation around a biphenyl a biphenyl's ground state's 45 degrees and it goes through this planar transition state that's about six kilojoules in energy. And if you substitute the biphenyl, that's a classic Mislow uh, racemization uh, reaction. So we look whether we could directly observe this flat planar bipyridyl, uh, biphenyl. So we put this biphenyl into a protein and so we're gonna do this and we're gonna stabilize this transition state and make it persistent by putting in a protein bottle where the protein bottle stabilizes the planar conformation of the transition state configuration. So we put this uh, reaction as a side chain of alanine. So we made a biphenyl substituted alanine. We then went through um, the protein database and looked for a site. It happened to be in a threonyl synthetase where we can actually build a site that bound and stabilized the, the flat biphenyl. And we weren't sure whether we could do this. It was kind of a reach for computational biology, but we did do this. And the first one we designed with seven mutations in this enzyme, it, it stabilized a 28 degree uh, dihedral angle conformation of biphenyl. So we were a little off. So then we made some more, we went back, solved the structure, uh, did, a, did another round of, of engineering and we got it down to 13 degrees. And at this point, the postdocs who was working on this, Aaron said, 
you know, Pete, we're done. We're not going to be 13 degrees. And I, I'm like, come on, you know, you got to get zero or, you know, this just doesn't fly, okay? So we calculated a bunch of things and it didn't quite work. So I said, finally, why don't we just look at it, okay? Um, we're chemists after all. So I said, why don't we just make this veiling to isoleucine substitution and put a little pressure on the ring, the whole thing will be planar. And Aaron, yeah, right, okay, Pete, I'll do it. <laughs> but it turned out it was absolutely planar, a two angstrom resolution um, structure. So we actually did make a stable um, flat biphenyl in a protein bottle, which is kind of neat. Um, so that's design. Can you also make interesting proteins by using more evolutionary methods? So the first uh, foray into this was to look at a metal binding protein and ask whether we can actually evolve a metal ion binding site in a protein. And so the way we did this is we looked at a well-known metal ion binding protein called the zinc finger, um, where zinc is typically bound by a his his his, his motif uh, that's a structural element. Um, these are transcription factors, they bind to DNA. So what we did is randomize this region and introduced now to build the metal site, we're not gonna build it with a his, his, cis, cis. We're gonna build it from basically a bidentate metal ion binding amino acid. So we're gonna pre-organize the metal chelator by synthesis and then genetically encode it. So we genetically encoded this by, by pyridyl, put it into this zinc finger if it folds, and the, the bipyridyl binds the metal and folds it properly, then if you express it on phage and put the DNA sequence on a solid support, you should be able to simply affinity pan and pull out uh, a metal ion binding site. And we did that and we found, pulled out zinc fingers that bound DNA with the affinity and selectivity of the, 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 the native zinc finger, but when we looked at them, they were red. And it turns out we built a low spin iron two site not a zinc site. So we're actually beginning to build unnatural binding sites using this expanded genetic code, which is pretty interesting. Um, we then went in and said, well, do metal, uh, do uh, 21st amino acid with that off confer an advantage to a whole living organism? So we decided to challenge E. coli um, with uh, stress. And the stress was expressing a protease and its guts, and the protease we expressed was HIV protease. Um, and we built this, this um, selection system, which is this tetracycline antiporter. If you have active HIV protease in the cell and it clips this sequence, the cell becomes tetracycline sensitive and dies. So um, then we said, okay, let's just make a library of cyclic peptides on the ribosome uh, and simply select for cyclic peptides that inhibit HIV protease. And let's give E. coli a 21 amino acid code and see who wins. So you make a large library of cyclic peptides with a 21 amino acid code. You look for surviving cells. And the answer is, is all of the survivors which inhibited HIV protease, protease had this keto containing amino acid. <laughs> was, Whoa, what's happening here? So we figured out that this keto group formed a stable shift base with lysine 14 on the surface of the protease, destabilized the protease as a dimer and basically precipitated out of the guts of E. coli and was inactivated. So if you give even E. coli a 21st amino acid that's an interesting functional group, it figures out I can make shift bases and I can figure out a whole new way to inhibit proteins that chemists don't do. Um, so that was interesting. We then, we, since then, we've actually gone into these um, uh, uh, ribosomally synthesized, post-translationally modified natural products, um, and, and we can actually make these now, uh, say in bacillus, um, with an expanded genetic code, and so now we can go into these natural uh, RIPPs and introduce uh, 21, 22, or 23 amino acids, we think. So, so we're looking at, at making these kinds of interesting uh, natural products um, with new properties. We're also starting to look at, at can you make proteins with interesting new properties using an expanded genetic code, both improve catalytic activity or improve thermal stability. So one way we did this experiment is we went into a truncated beta-lactamase that offers a thermal uh, 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 stability-based screen in E. coli. Um, and we randomly introduced 
long chain files into that protein. Now one important mechanism Mother Nature uses to stabilize proteins is disulfide crosslinks. But a disysteine disulfide crosslink has a very defined geometry and a very defined dihedral angle, so they aren't all that easy to engineer. So what we said as well, if you could make longer disulfide bonds, bridge longer distances, you might be able to stabilize domains that are further apart and more selectively stabilize the ground state of a protein. So we, we genetically encoded these long cysteine analogs. We randomly introduced at 144 distinct sites and, and beta-lactamase, this truncated beta-lactamase, these amino acids, and then we put cysteines at defined sites, seeing whether we could form a random crosslink. And then we just carried out um, a, a screen for E. coli survival at 40 degrees, and we found a protein that was stabilized by about uh, 10 degrees, 9 degrees, which formed an extended disulfide crosslink between alanine 184 and between this uh, residue 65. Uh, and those are hard to bridge. That's about 10 angstrom distance. It's really hard to bridge with a cysteine. And then we said, well, let's just feed other amino acids. So we feed it, fed the bug that library a keto amino acid again, thinking maybe we'll form a covalent adduct with a, with a nucleophile. And in this case, what happened, we did this in MET-A, which again offers a, a stability-based screen, but in the case of MET-A, which is a homodimer, we cross-linked the two uh, monomers with what looks like an adduct between the cysteine and the keto group of this benzophenone side chain. And shockingly, this leads to about a 26 degree increase in stability, which is almost a world's record for a single mutation, okay? So you can really start to do really pretty interesting things now using amino acids that Mother Nature doesn't have available. So we've also genetically encoded unnatural amino acids in mammalian cells using a variety of systems, including this baculovirus system. And you can now uh, genetically encode amino acids in, in cell lines and stem cells and neurons, primary cells and others. Uh, we've, to build more cell biology tools, we've actually genetically encoded um, small fluorophores. So GFP is a really important tool in biology, but it's this big protein you can really only put at the CRN terminus of, of proteins. Wouldn't it be nice to have a small fluorescent probe you can put anywhere in the proteome? So to do that, we genetically encoded this protein amino acid, and to show we could really put this anywhere, we put it at the binding site of glutamine binding protein in this cavity. And this is an environmentally sensitive fluorophore. So when you add glutamine, you actually see a shift in lambda max, okay, and fluorescent intensity. And you can directly get a binding constant out of putting this probe at one site, which, which is pretty incredible. And you can also clearly put it in proteins and various cellular organelles like you can GFP. Now you can also go to a 22 code, amino acid code. And we did that, and others have done it, by going to a four-base codon. So we've built these orthogonal pairs to put in multiple amino acids. And this works, but if you're going to a four-base codon that's, say, TAGX, you're competing with um, a release factor, RF1. So it's still a combination to put in your new amino acids. So George Church was nice enough to actually synthesize a whole E. coli genome where he took out the TAG codon. So now you have TAGX. It's not competing with anything, and he took out release factor. And this works really well, so you can actually um, now suppress four base codons really quite efficiently. Um, you also can make the whole organism autonomous. Um, so right now it's a feeding experiment. We have to feed the unnatural amino acid. You can genetically encode it, and then you can build a biosynthetic pathway for it. So we did that with aminophenylalanine by pulling out three enzymes from streptomyces that converted charismic acid to paraminophenylalanine, and now you throw this guy in the dirt and it's on its own. Come back in a million years and see what happens. I don't think I'd do that here. It might be an interesting experiment to run in Boston, though, okay? <laughs> uh, so, for about a billion years, life on the planet's been constrained by a 20 amino acid code, more or less, and I think we've now shown you can use chemistry together with the tools of biology to remove that constraint. And now, the interesting thing is, is what can we make now that we're no longer constrained by nature's genetic code? So that's 
one aspect of what we do. I'd like to briefly um, finish by talking about another aspect of what we do. And that's now not to deal with large systems of molecules, but very small organic molecules, but still change the properties of living organisms, okay? Um, and we're going to do this um, via a, a, a kind of biologically inspired approach, the combinatorial approach of the immune system. When the immune system makes an antibody, it makes a billion and then mutates it and simply selects for the one that works. Um, chemists have figured out how to make large libraries of organic molecules, but nobody's yet figured out how to select one that works. That's a huge, interesting challenge. So we screen. And when we started this, uh, actually at GNF, it cost a dollar a molecule to screen. So that meant if you had a million compound library, it cost a million dollars for every experiment. No artists can afford that, but most academics can't, okay? Um, so we built uh, these high throughput screening systems. Uh, when you see these yellow robots from the automobile industry, automotive industry, uh, these are Stavli robots. Uh, those are actually all derived, started at GNF, because uh, my head of engineering, who was my college roommate at, GM, uh, at Caltech, became a chief engineer at GM. And in the 90s, he designed the first hybrid car for GM in the 90s. And GM said, this is a bad idea. It's never going to fly, okay? So <laughs> why don't you come to La Jolla? Didn't take him too much time to, to convince him. And so he said, look, you, you guys aren't real engineers out here. Real engineers make refrigerators that you don't unplug in 10 years and cars that you can drive 200,000 miles. So he got all of these robots and built all of this. But the important point now is it costs a few cents to run a screen um, in a few days. So what it did is it made this an academic tool. And the question is, is now that you can do this as academic scientists, what do you do? Because what you don't want to do is do what pharma is going to do anyway, because they have more resources and more experience um, uh, than we do, and so that would be silly. So we got into regenerative medicine. Um, if, if you cut the tail off a newt or the leg, it grows back. It's amazing, right? I mean, I, I think it's amazing, okay? If I cut my finger off, I have no finger the rest of my life, okay? <laughs> And when you get to a certain age, you really worry about these things, okay? So I got really interested in regenerative medicine in my 50s, okay? Um, and the other good thing is when you're a chemist and you think about something early enough, you can do something about it, okay? Um, so we got into this, okay? And I went into the group and said, guys, we've got to start regenerating body parts. Um, and let's, let's not fool around with cell therapy, okay? Let's just do this with drugs and work on, you know, endogenous somatic stem cells, okay? We'll give a drug, it'll, it'll control the fate of an endogenous cell, either in the brain or the blood or wherever, and we'll just do regeneration on people. So, and we thought we'd learn some biology, too. So we got into this, we really didn't know anything about stem cells, so we started out with a simple stem cell. I'm using chymal stem cell, which can differentiate into bone, adipocyte, osteoblasts, adipocytes, or chondrocytes. Um, and what we want to do is to control this. So if you want to make more bone, you find a small molecule that converts MSCs to osteoblasts. And we found a molecule that did that. But I'm not interested in bone repair. Um, when I ride my bike, and I get off my bike, and I walk up the stairs, my knees hurt, and they creak, OK? So I went in the lab, and I said, no, no, guys, we got to work on chondrogenesis for osteoarthritis. And it turns out, um, so, so the idea is convert an MSC to a chondrocyte selectively, make new cartilage, and do repair. You don't need to have your knee taken out. You just get a little shot, and you make new cartilage. 30, 30 million Americans alone suffer from OA, and there's no disease-modifying therapy. But these most people actually have MSCs in the joint. So we said. Simple thing. Let's just find molecules that turn MSCs into chondrocytes and make cartilage. We didn't know what the targets were, the biology, so we said let's just do a phenotypic screen and look for cartilage, okay? It's pretty simple-minded. Found some molecules. First molecule we made, found. Phil, this is a one-step synthesis, okay? It's, it's scary, okay? Um, 
we looked at that molecule, and it turns out it's not a protease inhibitor. And it, 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 um, so we put it into a, a mouse model. And it, if you take a rodent and destabilize a knee, either enzymatically or surgically, you got what looks like an OA lesion. OK, this is a naive joint. This is a destabilized joint. If you give this molecule, first generation molecule, you actually repair, OK, um, which was pretty amazing. So we said, how does this work? And so we figured it out. It turns out this molecule binds to a cytosolic protein called filament A, and by, this is a scaffold protein. By binding to filament A, it, it blocks the interaction of filament A with this transcription factor, CVF beta. CVF beta traffics to the nucleus and turns on a, a set of transcription factors, RUNX1, that actually is prochondrogenic. Uh, so we're blocking a protein-protein interaction and selectively modifying transcription, which if you had told me that's what we were trying to do, I would have said forget it, OK? But, but it worked. And so we've now put this, we've made molecules, uh, analogs, that basically you take a fine needle, put them into your knee, OK? When they're out of the knee, they're gone. They have no half-life and, and huge solution. Um, they appear to be perfectly safe. And in canine models, which are the best preclinical model of osteoarthritis, they're actually remarkably effective, okay? Um, uh, so these are going to actually be first patient, first visit, uh, third quarter of this year. So we're really quite excited that this might work. Um, so we started looking at other areas where we could impact with regeneration with small molecules. And the other area is MS. Um, MS is an autoimmune disease. Your immune system attacks uh, the, the myelin sheath on the axons in your brain that connect the neurons. You lose the myelin sheath, basically your brain shorts out and you have MS. And there is no disease-modifying therapy. What there are are selective immunosuppressants. Okay, they're S1P modulators. They're made by Novartis, Receptos, and, and GNF have all made these. Um, they're, they're safer immunosuppressants, but they don't repair and regenerate, and they're not curative. So we said, well, what you really want to do is put myelin back on, okay, and just repair the damage that was done. Um, so we actually, what's the problem in MS patients? Well, it's, it turns out you don't have enough oligodendrocytes to make myelin. They make myelin. Uh, and that's because the precursor uh, progenitor cell doesn't differentiate into the oligodendrocyte, and that's called an OPC. So we simply set up a screen to look for molecules that would differentiate OPC selectively to oligodendrocytes. Make more oligodendrocytes, make more myelin, you're done. So we found a lot of novel molecules that we're exploring now that really look quite interesting in animal models. But we also found a known drug, an anti-muscarinic benztropine. And, and the first thing we looked at was gene expression, and it set up this molecule is making oligodendrocytes. It's probably what we want. But then we went across the street to Rusty's lab and uh, said, look, let's see if we have function. So the functional assay we did was a, a co-culture um, of, of neurons and uh, OPCs. And when we added this molecule, we made oligodendrocytes. And the reason we knew that is we could directly image remyelination of the axons. So that's really good functional evidence that you're doing what you want. So we said, well, if that's true, let's prove it. So we actually looked at any effects these molecules might have on the immune system, either on cytokine levels, in vitro or in vivo, on, on cell numbers, what have you, no effect. Uh, uh, in an adoptive transfer model, mice treated with benztropine still got disease when the T cells were transferred, so that was consistent. Uh, and it also works in an autoimmune independent model of MS called the Cuprazone model, which is a toxin-based model. So we got really excited by that. Um, and so the idea is if you really have a remyelination drug, um, you could combine that with an immunosuppressant. So we did that. Um, and, and what's exciting is benztropine works as well as FTY720, which is right now the S1P that's the gold standard. Uh, FTY720 has first dose cardiac monitoring because it causes bradycardia, so you want to lower the dose. So we showed we could lower the dose by a factor of 10, lower the dose of benztropine by a factor of 4, and achieve the same efficacy in multiple mouse models with that combination. So what are you doing? You're actually making FTY720 a safe drug. Okay, you're increasing the TI tenfold. And you're making it 
a remyelinating repair drug, okay? So we're really excited about this and looking at doing directly a phase two study. Now, the other thing you have to do if you're interested in regenerative medicine um, is in some cases you want more stem cells. You don't want to control the fate of stem cells, you want more stem cells. And, and that's true in bone marrow transplants, which is the oldest stem cell therapy we know of, okay? If you have a blood cancer, what do you do? Well, you kill all of your cancer cells and put in new hematopoietic stem cells, and those make up, repopulate all the cells in your blood, the white cells, red cells, macrophages, and so forth. But about half of the people who need a bone marrow transplant just for cancer, blood cancer, can't find a matched donor. So it's a big problem. It's not really a problem because people can bank umbilical cord hematopoietic stem cells. And if you bank H, uh, cord blood, HSCs, you have a match, you know, you give birth, you bank your kids HSCs forever, they can do a bone marrow transplant. The problem is, is when you try and transplant a small number of cord blood HSCs, which is all you get, um, the, the success of a bone marrow transplant correlates with cell number. And you really don't get enough cells even often to do a pediatric transplant more or less an adult. So the simple solution again here is set up a screen, throw molecules at it, and look for a molecule that simply expands an HSC in an undifferentiated state. You've solved the problem. So we got HSCs. We screened a small library actually um, made at the time uh, by Shunding and Nat Gray. And it was like 20,000 compounds, and we found this molecule. And it expands 40,000-fold um, uh, um, uh, HSCs, these HSC population after five weeks. They're fully pluripotent. So then we put this in kind of the gold standard model, which is a skid repopulating cell model uh, in a mouse. So you basically are putting a human blood system back into the mouse. So we got cord blood um, HSCs, expanded them with a small molecule, got a tenfold expansion, which is really quite large, put them in the mouse and completely made a human blood system in a mouse, and that could be uh, engrafted in other mice. So that was really exciting. Um, and believe it or not, we didn't do any chemistry on that molecule. It came right out of a screen, okay, of a small library at Scripps. And uh, it's actually been shown to be successful in cord blood transplants by Novartis. So this looks like it actually could be a solution for the bone marrow transplant problem. Um, we also figured out how it worked, okay? Um, in this case, we just looked at the gene expression profile, and it turns out this molecule an antagonizes a nuclear hormone receptor called the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. So, so when you get these results, you go into, you know, wiki gene, you know, Andrew Sue's wiki gene, and you look it up, and what is AHR, okay? And it turns out it's a nuclear hormone receptor that is agonized by environmental toxins like, like dioxin, which turn on P450s and detoxify these toxins. Well, if you antagonize it, you expand cord blood HSCs. So again, I think this shows that you can actually learn interesting biology, too, by doing these unbiased screens with interesting molecules. So we've also gone into embryonic stem cells and looked whether we could control their fate. And so we're trying to make beta cells and liver cells. Um, and so we, we, we tried first to go to from an embryonic stem cell to definitive endoderm and then on to a liver cell. And so we screened a library and found stalpermid, which is actually not a kinase inhibitor. It doesn't inhibit any known kinase. But if you add this molecule to either human or mouse embryonic stem cells, you actually make definitive endoderm, and you do it really efficiently in chemically defined media. And so we've gone on. The question is, how does it work? Okay. Well, the first thing we did is we, we added different signals. So we added, instead of active NA and made definitive endoderm, we add, added retinoic acid made neural cells, and we added BMPs and made cardiomyocytes. And we're like, whoa, 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 what is this molecule doing? This molecule is basically cell telling a stem cell to differentiate in response to whatever signal you put there. And so it's a very different kind of molecule. It's not controlling fate. It's basically saying stop being an embryonic stem cell. So it turns out we found the target of this molecule, again, by affinity methods, and it binds to a transcription factor called NME2. 
And when it binds to NME2, it blocks NME2 nuclear localization. And it turns out that inhibits uh, uh, NME2 regulates CMIC transcription. So you're blocking transcription of CMIC, and it's, a, it's an important, MIC is an important self renewal gene for embryonic stem cells. So that was pretty interesting, but MIC is also a really important oncogene. So we actually said, well, maybe this molecule could actually be used to suppress MIC expression in cancer. So we looked at, at, at cell lines and showed that stalpromide suppresses MIC expression in leukemic cells. It actually then induces differentiation of those cells, including primary cells isolated from AML patients. And so we put this into a xenograft model, a MIC-dependent uh, renal cancer, and we actually completely suppress uh, tumor growth. So this is really pretty interesting, okay? So we think this, this could be a, a really exciting direction to go. Um, now, another thing people really care about is transdifferentiation and reprogramming of cells. So instead of sending a cell along a lineage that it will normally go along, can you send it along different M lineages and block those? And so, you know, the best example of this is reprogramming of fibroblasts to induce pluripotent stem cells. But we looked at where transdifferentiation might play a role in human disease, and, and that is in fibrosis. If you take all forms of fibrosis, heart, liver, lung, skin, um, it's the leading killer in the developed world. So there aren't that many good antifibrotic drugs. There's a huge paucity. Um, so we actually set up a screen. Again, there aren't enough targets here. So we simply set up a phenotypic cell-based screen where we took hepatic stellate cells, induced them to form myofibroblasts by adding TGF-beta, and then this goes on to fibrogenesis, and then simply looked for molecules that would block myofibroblast formation. And again, we set up an image-based screen uh, with, with smooth muscle actin as a reporter and found a, a bunch of known molecules and novel molecules, and we're pursuing all of those, and we have some really pretty exciting molecules. But one of the molecules we found actually not only works for liver um, fibrosis, but it works in every setting we've looked at, okay? Cardiac fibroblasts, pulmonary fibroblasts, and dermal fibroblasts. And that molecule blocks myofibroblast uh, uh, transdifferentiation based on gene expression. So we put it into animal models, and the first generation molecules actually work really quite well in liver fibrosis and in lung fibrosis. This is a bleomycin model of lung fibrosis. This is normal lung. If you treat normal lung with 25 mg per kg uh, of bleo, you get this. 12 and a half mg per kg, you get this. If you treat with a small molecule, it looks pretty much like normal lung, okay? So we're actually, with BMS now, moving this aggressively um, to the clinic um, for scleroderma. Uh, we're not quite sure exactly how this molecule works, but it appears to bind a protein that's involved in trafficking of important membrane-bound proteins that play a role in fibrosis, and by blocking that trafficking, you inhibit myofibroblast formation without really having a significantly adverse effect on the cell. Now, finally, um, you know, when I get on a plane and I go to Europe or Japan or China, I, I don't sleep for days because I get really bad jet lag, okay? And, and so, you know, I'm starting to go down to the lab, you know, and it's like, guys, we got to work on prostate cancer. I'm in my late 50s. we got to work on OA. So, so we got to work on circadian rhythm, okay? So... I was having a beer with Steve Kay, and I said, Steve, we got to work on this. He's like, Pete, this is not a problem. We can make cells that, that you know, will hook up one of the key, you know, clock transcription factors to luciferase, and we can just actually, in a test tube, uh, monitor the cell cycle by emission of light, okay? And let's just add molecules to these wells and just image, okay? And we'll find molecules that... It, that alter um, uh, circadian rhythm, either the period or the amplitude. And so we did this, and shockingly, um, uh, we found a molecule, um, these carbazoles, and they actually work quite well, dose responsive. And in fact, a, a company Steve's involved in has these molecules now in, in IND enabling studies, and they actually look really quite interesting in vivo. But uh, um, we didn't quite know how they work because 
you know, um, what, what they do is they bind cryptochrome. And what you want to do is increase cryptochrome levels. And usually you think about small molecules as an inhibitor of protein function. But what this molecule did was increase cryptochrome levels. And so we finally figured it out. We didn't, it was an X-ray crystal structure that really told the story. Um, cryptochrome levels are med mediated by the interaction of cryptochrome with this other protein, uh, FBXL3, which binds to cryptochrome and leads to its degradation. And it turns out cryptochrome has a flavin site. This carbazole binds into the flavin site, displaces the flavin, and that creates an inhi inhibition of this protein-protein interaction that leads to increased cryptochrome levels. So again, as a chemist with that target, you'd probably say, whoa, 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 this isn't going to happen. But it, it actually did, in an interesting way, come out of a cell-based screen. So hopefully... Um, I've shown you that, that by using chemistry and biology together in interesting ways, and not only strategies of classical chemistry, but strategies of biology, you, you can change the properties of whole bacteria, okay, the genetic code, but you can also make molecules that will actually control regeneration um, in, in, in a human setting, um, and, and again, alter living um, life in an interesting and potentially beneficial way. And so... Um, I uh, probably, uh, you, <laughs> I'm fortunate enough as a chemist to probably have over my career the best group of coworkers one could possibly imagine. Um, the biggest challenge in my career is having coworkers that are so good that can to, to go into the lab every day and have them not think I'm the idiot in the group, okay? Um, but I've had a really terrific group of amazing students and really nice people who have been very successful in their own careers, and it's my source of greatest pride. And right now, this is my group um, at Scripps, and I tried to point out that we have a lot of collaborators um, at Scripps, Caliber, and, and you know, mentioned ones at GNF, and, and not only them, but their groups played a really important role in all of the work I described, and finally, I'd like to thank you for your attention.